Welcome back. So there are some interesting stories. Interesting stories when you look back through hockey history. But Mark Messier as a Canuck is one that I've touched on before. But I, I found this um, on, on eBay. And I thought, you know what? Just for that cover, there's Mark Messier. There's the killer whale. And Vancouver Canucks get new look, renewed grit. The Vancouver Canucks in 1994 go to the Stanley Cup final. 1995, they get out of the first round. 1996, they get knocked out in the first round. Uh, 1997, no playoffs. And this is a market that as soon as the Canucks started turning in the wrong direction, well, ticket sales went down. Season tickets were dropping. The Canucks needed to bring in some excitement and, you know, get the fans talking. And, and there was some determination that you had to have the big name. They also needed a number one center. So there's Pat Quinn and there's Mark Messier from the press conference that introduced him as being, he was painted as the savior to the Canucks. And, and I got it, you know, three years before that. And interestingly enough, there's, look at this, Joe Thornton, number one draft pick right there on the left. So this is why I get old magazines and, and old, old books, because it's always interesting to look back. And see like a fresh face Joel Thornton right across the page from Mark Messier. Hands raised in victory for joining the Vancouver Canucks. The belief was they got to win a Stanley Cup. Got it. Got to get this team back into the hunt. Got it. You know, there was some problems with leadership. They, there's a lot of talk in this magazine about leadership. There's leadership void. They need leadership. This was a team that needed number one center and leadership. Well, Mark Messier, who is respected as one of the best leaders in the history of the National Hockey League, and I'm not going to dispute that, he was a bad fit for the Vancouver Canucks. Not only that, but that was when they trucked out this look. They went from the skate to the Orca the year that Mark Messier arrived. So when people talk about how much they don't like the Orca, and ah, it's stupid, and yeah, I can't stand it. When they're when people are around my age and they're saying that, in back of my head I'm thinking, you remember Mark Messier at that press conference, and you remember that Orca Bay owned the team. So Orca Bay, we own the team. Oh, I don't know what should we use for for a logo, an Orca? Sure, we'll use an Orca for the team's logo, and it it did. It looked kind of corporate, and and I got it that at the time people didn't like it. Now you look back, the jersey that I'm currently wearing, Canuck fans like it. Anytime I wear it, I always get comments like, oh, that's that's a nice one. That's the throw. That's the original Orca, right? Cool. But at the time, none of us understood why they went away from the skate. Myself included. I remember the first time I saw that logo, I thought, that's it? How is that a Canuck? So I had the same opinion then. Now, it, you know, it's it's almost 25 years ago at this point. I've, I've really grown accustomed to the Orca. I like the way that it looks now in the jersey. I love the color scheme they use now. The color scheme they used then was bewildering. It was it was bizarre, right? This is a strange look. And yet, again, uh, when the jersey countdown takes place, you'll see these jerseys rated pretty high amongst Canucks jerseys. So, they lack the number one center. They lack direction. And, you know, honestly, it felt like this was a team that went, okay, we got to the final in 1994. We've got to get back there. And this was this was an attempt at, at a home run. And the Canucks offered money that nobody was offering. The Rangers didn't come close to offering. The relationship between the Rangers and Mark Messier was fractured. And he wanted to move on. He was willing to listen to offers from other teams. The Rangers didn't offer anywhere near what the Canucks did. So it was a three-year deal for $20 million and it had options for fourth and fifth years that would have taken the contract to 50 or $30 million over five years. So $6 million a year uh, on average. And it's a lot of money for a guy coming in at 37 years of age to have a contract that could take him until he's 42. Messier, huge name in the game. Again, I agree. Great leader, but um, while the options are there, they, of course, would not exercise them. After the third year, he left. Now, he would come after them later for more money because the team appreciated in value while he was there, which was part of the contract as well. And the Canucks basically didn't want to pay it, and he made them pay it, which is another reason why Canuck fans get mad at him. But he did what I think any of us would do if it's, well, I was supposed to make millions of dollars off that. I didn't get it. If I tell you, you get $5 million if you sue that guy. You might make some people angry. You're going to be like, but I get $5 million, right? So 
it, it was obvious that this was a team that wanted to change directions, and here we go. Uh, now, 100 season tickets sold the first day. So this is walk up off the street. This is before internet and all that and ticket hubs and all that. 100 people walk up that first day to buy season tickets. This was a team that was having trouble with selling season tickets. The enthusiasm in Vancouver, not always the greatest. And in the late 90s, that was the darkest time for Vancouver, I felt, as an organization. And it got thrown a lot on Messier. I'm not sure how much of it was actually Messier's fault. Now, the, the season they were coming off of, 96-97, 35 wins, 40 losses, and 7 ties for 77 points. They were 4 points behind the Oilers for that final playoff spot. So you can understand why you're looking at this and going, we were only 4 points out of the playoffs with Messier added as a free agent and with everything else working. Like, Matt, yeah, Kirk McLean had a rough year, but he'll bounce back. So if the right guys bounce back, we bring in Messier and he provides that leadership, we should at least be able to make up that four points on the Oilers, get back into the playoffs and playoff hockey with Mark Messier, right? So they're they're looking at it from that perspective, that we're close. And it is the most dangerous time for a franchise is to be close, not quite in the playoffs, and then try to make a major move to get over the hump. Sometimes, yeah, and other times it's a Messier situation. So this was a team that, that had McG McGillney. McGillney had, uh, I believe, just the 150 goal season for Vancouver, but he was he was a good goal scorer. It, it, the, here's the thing, and I know people are going to say he's a great goal scorer, right? But in Vancouver, he was good, but it felt like McGillney or Bure were going. It, you never got both of them going at the same time. So you'd be watching and go, wow, Bure was great last night. Where was McGillney? McGillney was fantastic last night. Where was Bure? And, and you always had that feeling like if you could get them on the wing... Right, one on one wing, one on the other, and you have Messier in the middle. Messier could get 150 assists, so there was some some sense to bringing in Messier for a team that was kind of broken. Where you have McGillney, Bure, Linden, who was still captain at the time of the signing, and of course the C would go over to Messier, which was very controversial for Canuck fans who love Trevor Linden, still do. Uh, Marcus Nasland, but he's young at this point. He's not become the Marcus Nasland he will years later. And Kirk McLean, who again takes them to the Stanley Cup final in '94. It's not that long after that. There's the belief that yeah, he can bounce back. So '97, '98 takes place. 25, 43, and 14 is the record. 64 points. Messier's part in this. He plays all 82 games. It is the only time in his run as a Canuck he played every game. 22 goals, 38 assists, 60 points. The points totals aren't high enough, but he's 37 at the start of the season. When he's signed to that contract by, by Pat Quinn and by Orca Bay, I, I think that they were looking at it as we're, we're picking up this huge name. He's going to go out there and he's going to score and he's going to be a leader. And he just wasn't that player anymore. So while he played every game and there was some debate about how healthy he was by the end of the season and whether or not he was playing through injuries, and and very likely he was, well, now, now the blame's going to go on him because it got worse. They went from 77 points to 64. So even though there's a lot of players on that team that had poor seasons, McLean, he's gone. Linden, traded out. Uh, McGillney missed 31 games that year. He only played 51. So you can look at this and say, well, their goaltending wasn't good enough. The interesting thing, too, is the article in this magazine makes a statement about how, uh, and actually I'll, I'll find it because I know where this is here. Um, as best he expects to be. Uh, the Canucks have added rookie... Uh, Matthias Oland and veteran Grant Ledyard on defense, but play behind the blue line remains an area of concern. A return to form of injury-plagued right winger Pavel Bure would also go a long way to turning the team's fortune around. That first year, Bure had 51 goals, but the defense wasn't good enough. So it's that it's that argument of okay, you got your number one center, but your blue line's not very good. Their goals for they were tenth in the league that year. So the scoring wasn't really the problem. Their goals against in a team of or in a league of 26 teams, they were 26th. They couldn't keep the puck out of their net. This is where we end up with Brian Burke taking over and of course Burke's going to go through a lot of goaltenders. The goalie graveyard comments going to come up from this. They bring in Archer Serbe to try to, you know, prop things up. Urbe has a good year and so they they get rid of him cuz he's short. I still don't understand that one. But Things are rough out of that first year. 
98-99 the second year, they get worse. 23-47-12, and 12, 58 points. Messier, for his part, his points per game are decent. 59 games, 13 goals, 35 assists, 48 points. Now, if you're counting on him to be your number one center, that's not enough. But again, the fault in this in this case is the idea that Vancouver was bringing in a guy they felt could be the number one guy that no longer had that there. Now, Messier's relationship with Canuck fans is, is really rooted in management decisions. So Mike Keenan came in as well. Now, Keenan didn't last that long. Um he, he steps in and makes some GM moves, and then Burke comes in. Oh, Burke's like, I can work with Keenan, and no, he can't. So Keenan would be out, but Burry ends up being out. Burry has a standoff with the Canucks, which has its roots all the way back to the 94 playoffs. Burry felt that he had been treated poorly by the Canucks, and if, if you look into that, and at some point I will, because you know a video on that is, is interesting, Burry felt like the Canucks have been treating him poorly for a very long time. And so he wanted out, he goes to Florida. In a deal that, that Keenan said, that's a good trade, and then they got rid of Keenan. So Keenan's out. Crawford's in as coach. Uh, under Mark Crawford, of course, the Canucks are going to have some really excellent levels of success. And that first year under Crawford in 99-2000, the first full year with Crawford in 99-2000, the record does get better. And this was the last year of Messier, 30-29-15-8. and eight. So you've got the four columns because you've got the overtime losses in there. Uh, but they had 83 points. They don't make the playoffs. At no point during Messier's time do they make the playoffs, which is going to color the opinion of, of Messier's time. But in 66 games, he had 17 goals, 37 assists, 54 points. That is not bad for a guy who's nearing 40. Those point totals are not awful. Uh, but again, McGillney's out now. McGillney goes to New Jersey in a trade for uh, uh, Morrison, comes back, and Morrison ends up being a very good center for Vancouver. And they had five different goalies that year, including Alfie Michaud. Like, it was it was a, a gong show in the Nets. But again, Messier will take a lot of the blame because he's making $6 million a year. And fans will look at that and say, for $20 million over three years, the value wasn't there. Now, Messier would leave Vancouver at the end of that year right? So they don't pick up the option on years four and five. He goes back to the Rangers and all's kind of forgiven between himself and the Rangers. And I don't know how much of that is after three years in Vancouver, he was just glad to be out. I would imagine that was definitely a feeling, but it, it is interesting because when you look at 96, 97, the season that was a, a disappointment for Vancouver and the move they made to try to fix things, I, I again, and I've talked about this before, I don't know how much of this is to blame on Messier. I know there was a lot of talking about the politicking and him getting the number 11 was where it started, where he was going to wear number 11, which had been retired by the Canucks previously, and they took it down. I'm surprised they never put 11 back in the rap in the rafters. I'm pretty sure no Canuck has worn 11 since, since Messier left. But I know that was where it started, which was, well, I want to wear 11. Well, but they retired the number. Oh, they unretired the number for... Oh, okay. All right. And then it became he takes the captaincy. And then there was discussions of friction between himself and Lyndon. And Lyndon ends up leaving. I don't remember Lyndon saying anything that necessarily dispelled the idea of there being problems. There were problems in that locker room before he got there. Like I said, you look at this article here. And it makes it clear there were problems in that Canucks locker room that they just figured, well, we can fix this. Um... One guy doesn't make everything right, but it sure makes a heck of a difference, said Lyndon, who will continue to wear the captain C, even though Messier is expected to become a become the true leader. I think Mark will be a leader no matter what letter he has on his shoulder. He will add to our leadership, and he'll be like he'll lead like he always has. You can never have enough leadership. It'll be great to have him on our side. Uh, Dave Babich, you can see his fire, the fire in his eye, his will to win, and it hasn't changed at all. He's the same type of player back then, a hard worker, always going, a no-nonsense kind of guy. Marty Jelena said he's a born leader. Uh, he reads the game and others so well when it's time to demand uh, from other players, he'll do that. And when it's time to back off, he'll do that too. So as the Canucks go through this nightmare season, I can imagine the amount of tension in the locker room. I can imagine him basically telling guys this isn't good enough. And maybe there's some pushback against that, right? Um, 
And this is kind of funny, too. Uh, goaltender Kirk McLean coming off back-to-back -back shaky seasons has something to prove. The acquisition of veteran Archer Zerbe provides a measure of insurance, but he hasn't been a number one goaltender since 1994-95. And the reason I find that funny is because, of course, Vancouver didn't really give him the opportunity to really get that number one job, and then he goes on to Carolina and they go to a Stanley Cup final. So there were some interesting decisions made at that point. The, the Messier addition was just part of what was a dysfunctional Canucks. And it, I, I think it's noteworthy now because I see some of the similarities between the team then and the team now. The difference being that team had the 94 run that they looked back on and said, well, we want to get back to that. Sometimes with the current Canucks team, I feel like they're they're trying really desperately to, to get into the playoffs, to gain that relevance. And sometimes I think they do it to their own detriment. But, uh, you know, again, uh, the, the idea of signing Messier for three years. It's interesting, too. There's in here, there is a commentary on this, uh, which is right close to it. Uh, Cavalier, Trotz. Oh, here we go. Uh, could big deal lead to financial mess? So this is Mike Brophy talking about it. Um, news, Mark Messier signs a three-year, 20 million U.S. deal with the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, my view, paying $6 million to Messier at age 37, no problem. But Messier, six, $6 million for Messier two years later at 39, no way. Only a Stanley Cup victory in the next two years justifies such extravagance. Uh, Vancouver acquires Archer Survey. My view, leadership Messier provides will be a moot point if this is how the Canucks plan to address their goaltending woes. Kirk McLean's coming off back-to-back -back poor seasons. And by the end of the year, Tom Rennie had lost faith in Corey Hirsch. So if Urbe's to the res so it's Urbe to the rescue, dream on. And it's odd because Urbe had a pretty good year. Urbe wasn't really the problem. But yet there were problems in that and problems on the blue line. And they, they brought in a 37-year-old and went, this, this is the guy we think can be our number one center. It, some questionable decision-making. All right, but there you go. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.